so seriously. You're, You're listening, listening to, to Table, Table Talk, Talk Radio. Radio. I, I like how he ran in the room thinking that you accidentally articulated baptism incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. You're he mistaken. Said to me. He said, <laughs> you sound like a heretic. Right. Yeah. It wasn't like, boy, they must be playing a game where they're articulating someone else's belief. It was, I think Pastor Wolfmiller is off his rocker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed that you think that I would actually teach that about baptism. <laughs> and it's so, 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 so deserved to be crunched. I mean, mega crunch. So, uh, if you guys put the mega, mega crunch. crunch on the song, that would be awesome. <laughs> keep uh, preaching the word, pastors. Keep it mediocre. Mediocre and hilarious. You are listening to Table Talk Radio, where jokes are not always the main feature. Is that true? Obviously. I don't know. I was, uh, my brother called Thomas was listening to table talk radio with my niece called Charlotte. And Charlotte said, does uncle Brian just sit there and make jokes the whole time? Yes. That's all. That's all it is. But, but they're not always considered jokes, which is what the, I mean, loosely they're, they're attempts at jokes. Mm. They're just not always that's right. jokes shooting. <laughs> shooting ducks duck jokes in the barrel but sometimes oh by the way he is risen he's risen indeed hallelujah all right in the we're in easter Easter season season all right good well done Uh, how was how was easter at saint paul austin great all the people came to hear the easter preaching and that they heard something like it we in fact we had the monday thursday good friday easter vigil which i had never done an easter vigil before you know, it's like, who's going to make the campfire and all this stuff? That's complicated service. <laughs> By the time we got to Easter Sunday, it's just like a normal service with a lot of hymns. I'm like, oh, it's great. You don't have to get into like the liturgical handbook. It, the, it's like the Boy Scout handbook, you know. <laughs> Anyone bring a flint to start the fire? So that was great. My first Easter you, vigil. People at St. Paul's were like, Pastor, we're having Easter vigil, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is? <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, we'll do that. That's yeah. my buzzword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told Jonathan, I said, "Vigil it up, man," and he uh, and he did. He came into my office. He says, "So there's 14 readings," and I said, "Okay." And he said, "Okay, all <laughs> you want to do all those?" And I'm like, "Yeah, okay." But I didn't realize that the readings were like, start at Genesis chapter one and stop yeah. when the sun comes up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a thorough uh exploration of the text so we had all 14 it was great it was great cool that's, how I, long was that I, an hour and 50 minutes only which is an amazing but that's because my sermon was 30 seconds long i mean oh. a couple of people one guy told me he says you, you know it's an hour and 40 minutes in and and then i get in the pulpit and they're like sermon huh <laughs> I and then I did that. preach the sermon, the shortest sermon ever, to which the vicar said, "You're never going to top it." It was eight words. <laughs> I I did notice that because your sermons uh, download onto our 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 uh, radio station. Oh wow! And normally, you know, I you know it's coming out to like a 15, 20 minute sermon or something like that because it you know has to fit in the hour. And uh, recently, it was like an eight minute sermon. I'm like, man, I need to go to St. Paul Austin and get away with an eight minute sermon. I don't. I, so my sermons are in general getting longer, but I think my, my Monday, Thursday sermon, well, maybe my eat my Palm Sunday sermon was pretty short. And then Monday, Thursday, medium, good Friday, long Easter vigil, very short. And I, cause I told the story. So when I was, you know, when I went crazy this summer, when we weren't doing table talk radio, cause I got the COVID. And I and I'm sitting in the backyard and I'm like, I just real dumb. And uh, and I figured, well, maybe the Lord wants a real dumb pastor. And I said, well, how, how do I even know how to preach? I said, well, maybe all I can do is stand up there and say he shouldn't. But Jesus really loves you. Amen. So that's what I did. I preached the sermon <laughs> I wrote this summer. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's all really interesting stuff. I'm sure everybody cares about. Uh, <laughs> you asked the question. <laughs> You're killing time here. I got lots of games to play. Oh, and... yeah. We got games galore today. So at least you get after it. Yeah. What's your buzzword, though? Uh, Holy Spirit. This is my buzzword in the hopes that we're going to have Holy Spirit Bible be at some point. We are. Can. We are. The Holy yeah, Spirit. The third person uh, in the uh, Holy Trinity. The most blessed and holy trinity. God be praised. 
And I'm thinking about doing a Bible study on the Holy Spirit. We're, we're up for a new Bible study on Sunday morning for, for church. And so I'm trying to think about what to do. And I think that's might be what, and I found this really interesting book called the dictionary of Bible themes, which I'd never seen before. And I found it last night and I couldn't stop reading. It's like one in the morning when I, it, it, had, it just lists basically all these, I mean, I don't know how many hundreds of verses about the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's an amazing little book. So uh, I think about just using this outline for the, we studying the Holy Spirit for the next five years, but yeah, you just right. find a book that does all the work for you. And Hey, I got a new Bible. I, study. I, I, not, I have endless Bible studies now and also table talk <laughs> radio. Crap. All right. Good. Well, uh, my theological buzz phrase for you is uh, marks of the church. So oh. in, any, in any church, there's a number of people named Mark, and you put them all in the same pew, and there are the marks of the church. Nice. <laughs> we, bapti- or, we baptized a guy named Mark at our Easter vigil. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, there's your mark of the church. Yeah. Uh, at the actual, one of the actual marks of the church. So marks of the church are talking about, you know, where is the church? We, we don't ask the question much, who is the church? Um, because the church is invisible, but we can tell where the church is. And that is because the Holy Spirit is working uh, in the gifts of God, the gospel and the sacraments to um, bestow and uh, create faith and sustain faith. And so where a church is proclaiming that uh, gospel of Jesus Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins, and uh, where uh, the uh, baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is, and where uh, the Lord's Supper is being administered rightly, uh, there we can say the church is, because there the Holy Spirit is working to uh, create and sustain faith. So those are the marks of the church. You know what's interesting? So the our Book of Concord gives us, what, two, right? Gospel rightly preached, sacrament rightly administered. Uh, in this work that Luther did on the councils and the, ch- on the, well, basically on the councils and the church, has seven marks of the church. Have you, do you remember, uh, I think Professor Pless was preaching on the seven marks of the church when you and I went to Madagascar. Hmm. Do you remember that? I was going to say, that sounded familiar. Do you have them there? Uh, uh, yeah. I, so, um, uh, yeah. Also, let me show you. I'll share the screen. So, so I published this Luther's on the councils in the church um, uh, a few years back. So people can download it for free from wolfmuller.co. Um, and, and it has the list here. So here's one first, the, the Christian holy people is to be known by this, that it has God's word. Mm -hmm. That's one. Uh, second is going to be baptism. Uh, second, second, it says here, God's people or the Christian holy people is known by the holy sacrament of baptism when is rightly taught and believed and used according to Christ's ordinance. Third, God's people or a Christian holy church is known by the Holy Sacrament of the altar. So Lord's Supper. You writing this down? Yep. Fourth, uh, I think it's going to be confession. People of God or holy Christians are known by the keys publicly used as Christ decrees, Matthew 18, 15. Uh, fifth, it's the seventh is the punchline here that we're getting towards. So fifth, the church is known outwardly by the fact that it consecrates or calls ministers or it has offices which they occupy. For we must have bishops, pastors, or preachers to give, administer, and use publicly and privately the four things or the four precious possessions that have been mentioned. So the first four are the precious marks of the church, mm. the cr- mm. faith-creating ones. Fifth, it, the, basically the office so that those things will be given, given out. Sixth, I think, is going to be prayer. Let's see if that's right, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, all this talk about the Lord's Supper. Oh, yeah, Luther's talking about marriage and should all these other things be considered sacraments, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, look at the blockheads that don't have the same idea of purity. <laughs> it's great. Uh, six, the holy Christian people is known by prayer and public thanksgiving and praise to God, where you see and hear the Lord's prayers prayed and the use of it is taught, where the psalms or spiritual songs are sung in accordance with the word of God, and the right faith, when the creed, the Ten Commandments, and the catechism are openly used, there be sure that a holy Christian people is. So prayer, liturgy, public praise, teaching of the faith, etc. That's the sixth mark of the church. And then seventh, ooh, are you ready? The holy Christian church is outwardly known by the holy possession of the holy cross. It must endure all hardship and persecution, all kinds of temptation and evil, as the Lord's Prayer says, from the devil, the world, and the flesh. 
It must be inwardly sad, timid, terrified, hmm. outwardly poor, despised, sick, weak. Thus, it becomes like its head, Christ. Yeah, that's great. Can't go wrong reading a little bit of Luther. No, uh, I will put uh, maybe we'll put the uh, link in the show notes. You just download on the Council of the Church is a beautiful text to look. And this is at the very end. Uh, I think I'm a page. I'm on page 245. Do you believe that I read the previous 244 pages? No. I published the thing. You still don't think I've read it? <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> I, I might have skimmed. <laughs> marks of the church all right i got it boom all right so we that that concludes the first segment of of uh, table talk radio but this is the lineup are you ready i'm sad we're gonna we're gonna listen to our voicemails all right uh we're going to do a little tink mams in the news with a story about a a canadian pastor who shouts the police out of the church (laughs) that's pretty good uh we're also going to be hearing um what jordan peterson thinks of the incarnation uh, what does that mean? And then if there is time remaining, which will force Pastor Wolfner to stay on task and be focused, we will play Holy Spirit Bible B. Yes. <laughs> which is the only thing he's waiting for. I know. All right. We got to <laughs> roll through these other things quick like. Let's go. All right. We'll do it. Robbie. Right Let's go. This is Table Talk Radio. You have been warned. Yep. It seems completely unnecessary to give out our phone number because I know the listener already has our phone number on speed dial in their phone. But just in case, 1-800-385-SOLA, 1-800-385-7652. Uh, you, know, you know how you can buy domains and sell them for top dollar? Do you think people are, are in the business of buying vanity phone numbers? Because that one that, probably worth some, worth some dough. That's right. We're, let's sit on it now. You know, the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that <laughs> those numbers are three, three, five. So it's only going to get better and better. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, uh, here's, here's some voicemails. You ready to, to hear from our listeners? Oh yeah. See what, see what they're thinking. We do want to know what our listeners are thinking about. And the voicemail system is a great way to chime in. And, and this is what one of our listeners uh, called in saying. Hey pastors. I just wanted to drop a quick note. Uh, just uh, some some constructive criticism, Uh-oh. you know. Try and help the Dirt show make loins. it a little better. <laughs> uh, you know, always looking to to you know improve ourselves. Uh, on season two, episode six, the name that church body at the beginning of the episode, there was a brief discussion about you know maybe Pastor uh, Wolf Mueller was the talent at one point. Now Pastor Gagline's the talent and we're, you know, who's the talent, Obviously. who's the tech person. And, uh, I, you know, I just wanted to drop a, a quick note and say, like, uh, talent is like, it's a strong word, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Point well made. <laughs> just not okay. reach for ta- what's, the, you know, what, so greatness and mediocrity talent and what's there what's below talent and above being awake sentience <laughs> I'm, I'm at a loss for words myself obviously uh, his point his point is valid if uh, <laughs> we're speechless okay who's the town ta- it's it was a relative <laughs> thing it wasn't like act you know it wasn't objective talent it was talented right yeah i mean it's like the the dirtiest shirt in the ha- in the hamper. I mean, or the cleanest shirt in the hamper. Right? Yeah, it's not clean. It's, it's just, just cleaner cleanish. than the rest. All right, we're gonna we're gonna march ahead because I know you're eager to get to Holy Spirit Bible B, uh, which seems to imply that there are times we played Bible B where the Holy Spirit was not uh, playing. No, the whole was not. I, I I mean that that is entirely possible. <laughs> The Holy Spirit blows where he wills, but 
this is a different kind of Holy I mean, Spirit no, Bible. Being. Normally, you cannot find the Word of God apart from the Holy Spirit, except for maybe during a game of Bible. I, I'm looking. I'm looking for those these verses that talk about how the Holy Spirit is the joy of Jesus. That is an incredible ah. thing. So, ah, very good. Okay, well, here's here's another one. Spotted on the back of a silver Ford Ranger with a snowblower in the back. Saw a bumper sticker that said, "Perfect joy is being." A Franciscan. <laughs> so they had those three different statements in different fonts. So we're not sure if they're related or not. Keep up the good work. All right. Perfect joy is being a Franciscan. Keep telling yourself that, guys. Do, do Franciscans, um, are they known for, for their use of snowblowers? They probably were clearing the path for lost squirrels or something. <laughs> yeah, probably. They're big into that animal care. Uh, I know, yeah. I guess was uh, St. Francis. I guess he was like one with all the animals or something like that. St. Francis was a sissy. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad. All right. I'm sorry, I must be on the wrong number. I don't know what radio this is. Have fun with your radio show. <laughs> oh, uh, perfect. Wrong number. Okay. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Did somebody screen these before you uh, I know. Just Jeez. keep playing them. Who knows? Some guy's going <laughs> to call the majority. He's going to slip through. I don't know. <laughs> One cut to the air. You're like, did, did you know that your auto warranty is out of date? What kind of <laughs> yeah. Did you know, by the way? So uh, we talked, I think, last episode about the only radio uh, show listening to spam uh, about uh, Rush Limbaugh. Yes. That uh, I, I, I didn't know until recently. This is kind of tongue in cheek, but I didn't know until recently, Snurdly was a real guy. Yeah. Bo Snurdly. <laughs> I always, I always kind of pictured that uh, Rush Limbaugh was talking to some imaginary producer that didn't actually exist, but he just would, uh, you know, talk to him. But anyway, yeah. he's a real guy. I saw an interview with him. Interesting stuff. All right. Here's another one. Hi. This is David in Arkansas. I've got a church sign for you. It says, Jesus has prepared a place for you. Have you prepared a place for him? Uh, that's the old uh, gospel law one, two. Yeah, that's right. So you, you, you talk about the thing that Jesus has done, which should be great comfort to your soul in which you could say amen right. and uh, sing joyfully to your day. But instead of that, you lay that you use that as a pivot to the law to shame the person mm -hmm. for not being as good as jesus gospel's a bribe <laughs> strings attached warning strings attached that that by the way is not grace that's what we call bribery uh, <laughs> yeah it's like jesus is like the godfather Can, uh, i've got i've got a deal for you i'll do this for you i'll scratch your back i'll forgive your sins goodness <laughs> If you prepare a place for me in your heart, I don't see the Godfather saying that. Yeah. Like, anyway, mm. all right. Well, let's let's dive into some uh, Ten Commandments in the news. Uh, figure out how to get my screen share going on here. It's, I feel I feel like a, a noob. Yeah. No screen share. Oh, I know why. It's because um, you think I'd I'd get the hang of this by now? Okay, here we go. I by the way have Here's thesaurus open and looks art cap capacity capability expertise flair genius gift knack know how power savvy. These are all I got to keep looking. So, Yesterday, right, here's here's the story. This remarkable scene: a policeman yeah. in a supposedly civilized country busting into an Easter service and attempting to close it down, uh, which was in fact an illegal act by those coppers. In this case, the mass ranks of the constabulary didn't measure up to one determined pastor, and he cast them out of his church. That preacher joins us now, Arthur Palowski. Uh, pastor, it is great to see you. You're joining us from Calgary, where those nice Canadian police uh, suddenly invaded, and you, you basically through the sheer force of your personality threw them out of the uh, temple, and it was a wonderful thing to see those guys uh, retreating down the stairs. What's interesting is uh, you grew up behind the Iron Curtain, and what happened to you uh, over Easter is exactly, I take it, why you didn't want to stay behind the Iron Curtain. 
That's exactly, sir. Thank you so much for having me. I grew up under communist dictatorship behind the Iron Curtain, under the boot of the Soviets. And I'm telling you, that's no fun at all. Um, mm. It was a disaster. Uh, police officers could break into your house five in the morning. They could beat you up, torture. They could arrest you for no matter what reason they would come up with. There was a famous saying in Poland when I was growing up by the police, give me a man and we will find something on that man. So it was like a black, uh, you know, flashback when those police officers showed up at my church everything kind of came back to life from my childhood. And the only thing I could do is to fend off the wolves as a shepherd, and I used my voice to get rid of them. They were <laughs> illegally uh, encroaching on our rights during the most holy days, during the Passover celebration. Uh, how dare they? Uh, the audacity of those people coming, it was a shocking thing. I was a little bit shaken, uh, but I did what every shepherd right now on the planet Earth should be doing, fend off the wolves. We as lions should never bow before the hyenas, and that's what they are right now. All right, so what are your thoughts on that? So wow, far? so I, I I don't, I didn't know this story at all. It's kind of amazing sort of thing. So they came to shut down the church, because what were they saying that was illegal to meet in Canada or something like that? Well, uh, I think it was concerns <laughs> over the coronavirus. So I don't know, I don't know what the laws in this part of Canada were as far as a uh, number of attendees or whatever. Uh, but the police wanted to come in, I guess, either check it out or were heard reports that it were over the number. And so uh, he said, look, you guys can't come in without a warrant, well, without a warrant. So get out. And he just kind of kept shouting, get out, get out, get out. And uh, they finally did. Wow. Um, now this, this is, um, this has probably been one of the great kind of theological questions of the, of the last year as you know, we, we all talk about uh, the fourth commandment and Romans 13 and subjecting yourselves to the governing authorities. And we've seen that. And we, I, I think, um, you know, all of us kind of had in, in our minds the hypothetical that this could happen. But uh, if you would have asked us two years ago that there's going to be a circumstance, whatever that circumstance may be, that the government's going to be, some governments in some jurisdictions saying that uh, people can't sing in church, I would say no way. <laughs> the government's not going to tell us we can't sleep in church. You must be crazy, right? Uh, but uh, lo and behold, uh, and so you know, uh, what are what have your thoughts been on this as far as the place of uh, how do how do we live um, as subjects to the governing authorities, uh, particularly when the governing authorities are saying for health reasons that you you know cannot meet or you cannot sing or whatever whatever the case may be yeah we we, we had these two standards i think al moeller talked about these two uh, he kind of clarified the language for him so that any sort of provision government restrictions needs to be equally ac applicable and also temporary so if there's any restrictions it has to be across the board it can't be uniquely applied to churches and it mm -hmm. has to be only a temporary provision what we're seeing though always the church brings out the worst in the state. And there's a reason mm -hmm. for that. The Lord has arranged it for that. And maybe we'll have to talk about that more when the music stops playing. I know it's, don't worry, it's temporary. <laughs> uh, we'll come back, get past the music. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna hear your final thoughts on that. So before the break, you were talking about how they need to be equally applied to all and need to be temporary. And that's what made this particular situation uh, interesting because the state, again, it varied from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but the state was coming along and saying, okay, we're going to deem certain things to be essential and certain things, I guess, not to be essential. And in, uh, in my state of Oregon, they said hardware stores, uh, marijuana stores, um, liquor stores, these things are essential, but they said churches, they're not essential. Um, and so, so it's not that they're necessarily targeting churches per se, but we do see almost the value system of the state coming out and uh, the church did not fit into the value system of the state. Yep. That's it. 
And so the church is always going to force the worst of the state because, and the family too, because the family and the, and the church stand on their own authority. They are not held up by the state and the state is this, it wants to always go beyond its bounds. It's like, remember how Luther talked about the law of God, how it always wants to do more than it's appointed to do. The state is like that. I mean, because the state is law. So the energy of the law is always wants to itself be transgressive. It always wants to go beyond what it's, it's appointed limitation. So the state wants to say, well, this is how you can sing. This is how you can worship God. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the response of the church is no. I mean, the, the the Christian is to submit to the government as as unto the Lord, as long as there's no contradiction between submitting to the government and submitting to God. But when the government comes along and says, do this thing or don't do this thing, which the Lord requires of us, like meeting together or whatever, then the Christian has to say, look, you're you're out of your pay grade. So you want to throw me in jail or whatever? Fine punish me but you can't you can't control it that way you you you're you can't you cannot require a breaking of god's commandments that's not right mm-hmm. right uh now I, the other thing that was interesting about that clip was uh what he said that uh un, under the kind of the uh regime in in poland you give me a man the police would say that give me a man will find uh what law he broke, whatever the phrase. So in other words, um, you know, that there's always kind of this front, there's this guy is like, we're just here to enforce the law. But, you know, when, when, when the state wants to uh, oppress its people, it'll use the law as a kind of a false front, you know? Um, And that's, that's kind of the thing that I think a lot of Christians have struggled with to say, look, um, most, most pastors that I know at the beginning of the coronavirus thing, uh, we're we're willing to to do what we could to help solve the coronavirus problem. I mean, um, when 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 the shutdowns first happened in Oregon, we were told. Well, everybody was told uh, it, this is a this is a two week thing to flatten the curve and all of this because we don't want to overload the hospital systems. And so when some of these lockdowns first started, we thought, okay, well, two weeks that sounds pretty temporary, right? You know, uh, if if we can you know, do what we can for two weeks to help out, then, then sure. Yeah. Why not? And I know pastors who, you know, close their services and, and that's fine, but then two weeks became a month and then one month became two months. And pretty soon, you know, four months down the road, wait a minute, why are we, uh, you know, going along with the idea that we're not going to meet to worship our Lord, to receive his gifts Mm -hmm. when the Lord commands us to, to do those things. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so the, the, the temporary nature of it is sort of a, a sliding a, a sliding scale. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and <clears throat> that, you know, it sneaks into the conversation. This is the new normal. And at some point we had, mm-hmm. to, okay, I mean, what do I know about masks and everything? Who, I mean, who cares, but, but, but the, the, not going to church, that is not, that, that is not a new normal. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. It can't be the Lord's right. people meet together. Right. And, and, you know, and all the other things that Christians do, not just going to worship, but, uh, Christians sing unto the Lord. I mean, that 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 was some of those things where, like California, especially was was dictating, uh, you know, those who go to church under the limit or whatever uh, must worship in this way. They must not sing. They must not receive communion from uh, a common chalice. And those are instructions. I mean, like it's one thing to say, uh, like like a fire code, you can't have more than three hundred people in this building because it's not safe. It's one thing to restrict those kinds of things. But to place restrictions upon the manner of worship, the way that you can worship, no singing, no, no common cup, these kinds of things. Uh, now the state has, I think, in my opinion, clearly crossed a line of telling me the way that I can worship. Mm-hmm. Because the, 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 the state doesn't know my conscience, only, only my Lord does. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. All right. You want to hear the next story here? It's not really a story. Yes. It's a it's a clip here from uh, Jordan Peterson. Oh yeah, this is talking. Jordan Peterson yeah. crying about. Yeah, I'm I'm ready. I heard about this. Okay, all right. This particular critic that I've been reading 
said, well, that, that doesn't differentiate Christ much from a whole sequence of dying and resurrecting mythological gods. And of course, people have made that claim in comparative religion. Joseph Campbell did that, and Jung to a lesser degree, I would say, but Campbell did that. So can I just pause real quick, and especially for our, our podcast listeners, uh, what was on the screen were the various kind of mythological figures right. who had particular claims of being, you know, God and man. And mm -hmm. so the question I think that Jordan Peterson is sort of reacting to is, well, couldn't Jesus be just another one of these mythological figures that was a claim of being God and man? So that's that's the backdrop. But the difference, and C.S. Lewis pointed this out as well, the difference between those mythological gods and Christ was that there's a there's a representation of there's a historical representation of his of of his existence as well now you can debate whether or not that's genuine you can debate about whether or not he actually lived and whether there's credible objective evidence for that but it doesn't matter in some sense because this well it does but there's a sense in which it doesn't matter because there's still a historical story and so what you have in the figure of christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth and in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't okay. know. I don't, I'm amazed at my own belief and I don't <laughs> understand it. Like, because I've seen. Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch you know, that's Jungian synchronicity. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real. Like, we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world. But the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that, in principle, is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, it, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. If you believed in the story of Christ, or if you believed that history and, and let's say the narrative make meet, let's Both, say. I yeah. think. I think you. Because when you believe that, you buy both those stories. You believe that yeah. the narrative and the objective can actually touch. Yeah. Wow. What do you think of that? That is a very interesting. I mean, Jordan Peterson generally follows Jung. I mean, he is a, I think he would call himself a Jungian. And so to depart from Jung in this way to say, how much responsibility oops. do you feel that you have? <laughs> Sorry about that. Right, as you say, some of them have. My apologies. I guess autoplay is on. <laughs> uh, so the. Um, to depart is an interesting thing. And to say that you have all these other myths, but Jesus makes this claim that this is, that he is a person. I mean, what we say in the creed that he's crucified under Pontius Pilate, that there's a, there's a historicity to Jesus, which is unique. Uh, that is, and, and and Peterson is pointing out the uniqueness of that. It's that's just nice to hear. Actually, it's mm -hmm. it's nice to hear someone come along because we're no, normally we're used to hearing all the other things. Christianity is always saying, "No, Jesus is unique. Jesus is different," and everyone says, "No, no, Jesus is just the rehash of all these other pagan things." And and for Jordan Peterson to come along and say, "No, no, Jesus is different. He has a yeah. to say he has a birthday. To, the, the, even just the claim that yeah. he was in history." If it's true or not, the claim that he's in history distinguishes what's going on with Jesus. And it's not like these mythological elements are lacking. It's saying that they happened in true life. Mm. So that the Greek myths, if you said, you know, who, whatever, these dying and rising gods, did they happen? No, it's a picture of what happens to the flowers or whatever. But with Christianity, we say, no, it happened. There was an empty tomb, a real place that Jesus was crucified. It's it's it has to do with all of these for me you know I always get the questions about like the shroud of Turin or the mm -hmm. Veronica the wiping the image of Jesus on the or the you know which is the actual grave of Jesus. And the point is 
not maybe that this is where Jesus was or that's where Jesus was, but the point is that there was there was a place where Jesus was. The Shroud of Turin may or may not be legitimate, but there was a shroud that Jesus wore. I mean, these things are real and true. And that sets the claims of Christianity apart from everything else. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that I think when people look for those sort of artifacts, um, I mean, I think most people admit that, yeah, that doesn't really matter you know, whether it is or it isn't, but people, people like those things because they can say, this is almost, this is the, the place where the, the thing in this world where it, it touched reality, but what, what really it is, is Jesus himself. So in other words, we can look to the incarnation rather than a shroud to find where that connection is. We'll be right. I want to do a few more things and we'll get into the Bible. Bible. The Low Budget Alternative to Staring at the Wall. This is Table Talk Radio. Staring at the Wall is so high budget. That's right. That's an expensive wall. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. I got the drum set. Carry it away. <laughs> All right. So we listened to that uh, Peterson clip. Now, I, I think the, the more interesting thing uh, isn't the distinction that Peterson makes between the 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 Christianity claim uh, cr the incarnation of Christ versus mythology but I think the more interesting thing is Peterson's um, contemplation of what that means so I mean rarely do you talk to someone who say hey in the person of Jesus is true God in human flesh and a person would say oh okay yeah uh-huh but what, I mean, what would it actually mean if if God is found among us? And um, you know, I don't want to I don't want to assume what Peterson was thinking or what was going through his mind. But it, it's from his reaction, it seemed as if he was really taking in the awe of that of that reality. And then maybe maybe again, I don't want to impugn anything to Peterson, but just. As so we can talk about his reaction, maybe that he thinks about what did that mean in in almost terms of the law. I don't know what your thought is, but uh, but is but he he talks about for him the the mythology uh, is is the the moral code to live by, and when that mythology becomes real here, that is I think the law for him. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's well. So may, there's something about these archetypes and the way that they interact with each other. That's what I think he means by this idea of the narrative sense of the world. And then when to see that then intersect with actual history is it, that, that's this. I mean, what this discussion is synchronicity, but this. Th that that profound moment where the eternal things become now the temporal thing, or they they find themselves in time, and it almost is sort of this. I mean, it, it is the incarnation. It's when the finite becomes capable of the infinite. It's mind blowing, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure how it would, he, you know, when he says the narrative sense of the world, which he saw in morality, we, and we think morality and we think law, mm. I'm not a hundred percent. There's a, there's a, mm. a straight line between the two. I'm, I'm not, I just don't know. I don't know Jordan Peterson well enough to know it would, I, it might be more of the sense that we're dying, but that death is not the end, which is certainly law apart from Christ, but. Yeah, I don't know. Very interesting. It's, it is well, very. That's a re, it, very intriguing conversation. Yeah, definitely. It would have been. It would have been good to to be sitting in front of him and be able to explore that a little bit more. But well, uh, next as, time when we have Jordan Peterson on as a guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tune, uh, I mean, ne next, next time, time he's over at the house, I'll just right, I'll just ask, ask him. him. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so as promised, we made some time. We have about seven and a half minutes hey! left to play a little Holy Spirit Bible Bee. So uh, you're all excited about this new book you found. So, uh, yeah, I found it on the Logos because I, you know, it's a, it's like a home, it's like handmade Bible studies. This book, Dictionary of Bible Themes, kind of cool. like it. I think some some Calvinists probably wrote it, but uh, <laughs> oh well. Uh, but there's a section. So I'm looking on the Holy Spirit because I'm thinking about doing a Bible study on the Holy Spirit, and the the Holy Spirit, and there's a section here 
30, 20, Holy Spirit, joy of, and then it says this, it's connected to Jesus, the joy of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So let's just take one. Let's. Uh, and you can see if you can guess it. <laughs> the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. What a mm. beautiful text. See, when you first started reading this, I, I, uh, I thought, oh, I know exactly where this is. This is probably going to be from the gospel according to St. Luke. However, uh, you read a bit more than I would have expected out of the gospel. So I'm thinking that you're reading the quotation in which Jesus reads from the gospel of St. Luke. Uh, so I'm going to say Isaiah. Indeed, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 3. Well done. Are you keeping score? Of course uh, I am. Okay. You want to do a little law gospel? So oh, so here's the, the joy and the spirit thing. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has appointed me um, to proclaim the Lord's favor. Where's the joy? Yeah. To, get, to grant to those who mourn in, in Zion the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, oaks of righteousness. So the spirit, and, and in fact, this, I, this language of the spirit, uh, the me here is Jesus. I mean, the Messiah before he's named Jesus. And so we see uh, Adonai Yahweh here. Uh, that's referring to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. So we see the Holy Trinity here. And God the Father has anointed Jesus uh, with the Spirit. So that's uh, this beautiful, beautiful text, um, yeah. et cetera. So. so, I mean, so, you know, the, the, fruition of this is when uh jesus is sitting in the uh synagogue and it was it was common it was common for uh guest rabbis i suppose you could say to to read the text and sort of expound upon it so, much like reading reading of the gospel and then preaching a sermon and so the scroll is is handed to jesus and he gets up and he, he reads this passage from isaiah 61 and says, uh, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. You know, here, here's the reading. And then the next thing that everyone hearing this reading is expecting is somewhat like a sermon. And uh, Jesus preaches uh, a short of a sermon as Pastor Wolf Mueller on uh, Easter Vigil. And he says, <laughs> Jesus says, uh, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's right. Uh, meaning, meaning that I am this one whom Isaiah was speaking about. I mean, just to, to think about that. <laughs> I think that's in Luke chapter four, isn't it? Like Luke verse 4, 18. 18. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, but here, but here Jesus himself is applying the, 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 the prophet speech to himself, uh, making himself the, uh, the fulfillment of that. So when, 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 uh, Jesus in John's gospel tells the Pharisees who search the scriptures thinking in them you have eternal life, but as they that testify of me, we see that the, the exact example of that here. The, this verse that I can never remember that says, you have anointed me with the oil of gladness above all my fellows. That's Psalm 45 verse 7, and that connects all of these. So the Holy Spirit and the oil and the, and the joy, are, those are all connected there as well. Really, really good. All right. Well done. You got the first one. Okay. I'm giving myself another 200 points for talking about it. So <laughs> well done. Okay. Are you ready? Round two. Ready. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Hmm. I think this is 
the gospel according to St. John. Gospel according to Luke. It sounds like John, though, doesn't it? In fact, in fact, the next verse is even more Johnian. All things have been handed over to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father and, and or who the father is. Uh, or who the father is, except the son and anyone whom the son chooses to reveal him. Yeah, I was putting this with the uh, high priestly prayer. Yeah. So let's see. Father, Lord of heaven and earth, father, uh, father, father. Look at all this. Father except the son. And then let's say the son, he, I, etc. The son, the son. And then there's the Holy Spirit. And this is the key verse that I, the thing that I was looking at. This is an amazing thing to just this first phrase before Jesus even talked. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now to think, okay, what does that mean? Jesus rejoices in the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I'm not 100% sure, but I think this, the Holy Spirit who reveals the will of God and as Jesus sees the Holy Spirit working in all the things that are happening, he, he delights in it. And I, and I think this rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, it was the same thing for like when St. Paul would say, I give thanks to God uh, for all of these great benefits. And all, Paul always begins his letters with thanksgiving because he sees the, the work of the Holy Spirit in creating and sustaining faith and so forth and so on. So Jesus sees the same thing, and he rejoices in the Holy Spirit. That's an amazing verse, actually. I'm not sure I'd ever really seen it. He hmm. rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. I mean, that clearly until last night. Hmm. All right, law and or gospel. Um, this is, uh, well, this depends. <laughs> <laughs> if you are the wise and understanding then this is law. Yep. Uh, and why is an understanding is not talking about a level of one's intellect, but I think, oh, did you hear that? What? Oh, no. Do you want to do some extra innings? Sure. Okay. So, uh, but it's gospel for those to whom he's revealed it, his little children. So. Indeed. All right. That's it. Thanks for listening to Table Talk Radio. Where the marks of the church are where you find the work of the Holy Spirit. Table Talk Radio is not for everyone. Please consult you like your pastor before. I, by the way, got your buzzword when defining my buzzword, so I get 500 points for that. Wow. What are you going to do with all those points? You have to listen to the extra innings in order to see how many more points I get. <laughs> more information, visit tabletalkradio.org. All right. Extra innings. Give me another one. All right, I'm going to give you a phrase, last one, and I. but this is a problem. We already talked about it, but here it is. Oil of gladness. Oh, hmm. where would that one be? If only I was paying attention to my phrase. <laughs> I'm going to say the Psalms. And uh, will I get points for guessing the chapter? Yeah. Uh, how about 45? Wrong. Hebrews what? chapter one, where it's <laughs> quoted. Kapow. Gotcha. I was close. <laughs> you were close. Now, okay, a couple of things that made so oil of glad here. Uh, now this whole section, let me uh, let me scroll down a little. This of Hebrews chapter one is so stunning. I, I was thinking about this a lot this last summer when I was kind of crazy because. Hebrews chapter one and Hebrews chapter two gives us this. It's it just, it basically goes through the old Testament and it looks for the conversation um, between the father and the son, which is a really cool thing to do. Actually. Where does the father talk to the son? Where does the son talk to the father? So especially where does the father talk to the son? And it's contrasting what the father says to the son to what the father says to the angels. Right? Mm -hmm. So he says, uh, when he brings forth his firstborn son into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him, Jesus. So the angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes the angels winds, ministers, a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God. So look at the father calls the son God. This is Jesus. Your throne is eternal. Hmm. 
the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Look how God the Father gives to the Son, the Son, the kingdom. You, this is the Father talking to the Son, have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, so God's talking about himself, me, your God, the Father. So look at this. The Father calls the Son God, and then the Father calls himself the, the Son's God. <laughs> this is wild. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, messiahed you, with the oil of gladness beyond your... Whoa, what happened there? Whoa, the, uh, that was cool. Take it easy. <laughs> with the oil of gladness beyond all of your companions. So that, so that this oil of gladness now is this the spirit, but look, the, the, you see, the, the, this instead of and and what is it contrasted to? The oil of gladness is contrasted to back to Isaiah sixty one, to the ashes of mourning. Remember when when Job, for example, has all these bad things happen, he pours ashes on his head. Whenever something bad happens, you pour ashes on your head. But that's not how the Messiah is anointed. He's anointed with the oil of gladness beyond all your companions in, in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. This is the one who's going to the cross, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you yeah. think this is ashes time. The man of <laughs> the man of sorrows. But, right. uh, but but he's but he has the Holy Spirit who brings joy. The Holy mm -hmm. Spirit brings joy. Uh, look, so here's the other verses. Can you see on the screen? This is my... Mm -hmm. This is my little dictionary Bible themes. Um, the Holy Spirit gives joy to the disciples in face of opposition. The disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the prisoners were listening to them. Paul were singing. Um, Become imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Look at that one. This beautiful verse. 1 Peter 4, 13 to 14. Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's suffering, etc. Uh, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. The Holy Spirit's fruit includes joy, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity. Look at this verse, Romans, Romans 14, 17. Uh, it says, uh, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the, the, this gift of the Holy, this gift of joy that the Holy Spirit has is really profound, but that it also belonged to Jesus. I mean, can you imagine that? That Jesus had joy because he had the Holy Spirit. I, it, it's just it's really so, beautiful so, stuff. So what does this mean for Christians? Well, we also have the Holy Spirit. It, it's just something I don't think we think about uh, probably enough, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that the Holy Spirit dwells with each one of us, and that He is cultivating His own fruit in us, that He's busy living and active, and that one of those fruits is joy. And so the Holy Spirit is coming to us in the midst of our sorrow and suffering and everything else, and stirring up in us joy because of who He is and because of all that Christ has done for us, because of this great hope and so forth that we have. It's just, it's kind of over and over. That the Holy Spirit comes and gives us joy. So if we don't have joy, what do we do? Well, here's one idea. We pray for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I mean, always we're praying for the Holy Spirit. Lord, send us your Holy Spirit uh, to give us righteousness and peace and joy. Mm -hmm. Ah, Good stuff. Well, I think that's so great. I'm going to give myself uh, a thousand points, wow. but I'm going to trade it all in for the joy of the Holy Spirit. How did you get points for that? You got it wrong. Well, I mean, I, I'm just a receiver of the blessings of the text. That's all it is. Grace. <laughs> by grace. T points are by grace and not by works, apparently, that no, well, one, I, would, I, no one would boast. I imagine we'd be playing a lot of Bible B now, huh? Did I found this awesome book? Yeah. Oh, I love this book. <laughs> all righty. Well, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for watching and listening, guys. Uh, always our voicemail system, 1-800-385-SOLA. For any thoughts or questions, bumper stickers, church signs, insults, compliments. Wrong uh, numbers. <laughs> yeah, we get those too. Uh, anyway, anything else? That's it. Christ is All risen. Right. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.